thank you for joining me today for our taking full advantage of photorealistic color with 3D printing demonstration. My name is Simon Andrelli. I'm an application engineer as part of the manufacturing solutions team here at Computer Aided Technologies. We'll jump right in, talk about what uh, photorealistic color 3D printing is and what some of the workflows look like in order to achieve said photorealism. So why are we here today? I'm here today to show you what types of workflows are possible and are used to successfully create photorealistic 3D printed models. Whether it's to show a client a sample with some real wow factor to make sure you get the project or cost and time savings in model making to improve your product to market time. Whatever reasons may be for needing photorealistic models, those models can be realized using a combination of some very specific hardware along with 3D software that comes in a plethora of varieties and flavors. Before we dive in to set hardware and software, let's take a moment to review what we need to control to achieve photorealism in our 3D printed models. First one's color. Our eyes can see a large color gamut or range. So the more color we can print, the more lifelike the appearance. Translucency. Transparent and translucent components are a large part of the industries that make models. May that be package design or automotive. Replicating the correct clarity or tint certainly add to realism. Texture. Most surfaces we touch throughout the day are not perfectly smooth. The ability to add leather, wood, or other physical textures significantly improves the tactile realism. And lastly, gloss. Glossy or matte objects play differently within their environments and can significantly affect realism. So now that we know what we would like to control, let's take a look at some printers that give us the most control over those properties. So there have been printers capable of controlling one or another necessary characteristic for many years now. I myself started working with full color 3D printers some 15 years ago, but achieving photorealism, photorealism was a far distant reality at that point until roughly 2016 when Stratasys launched the J750 full color 3D printer. The J750 platform received steady material and software upgrades, increasing its capabilities until the, this past fall when the J8 series was launched, starting with the J850, then the J835, and most recently the J826. All three of the J8 series printers have identical capabilities, the only difference being the build platform size. So the J series printers work by jetting UV photopolymer resin out of industrial piezoelectric print heads, similar to those found in industrial 2D printers. A thin slice, up to 14 microns in thickness, is jetted into the shape of the part as the print heads move in the X and Y direction on the gantry. Surrounding UV lamps cure the resin, turning it from a liquid into a solid. Once a layer is completed, the print platform moves down one layer thickness and the process repeats until the parts are finished. The J7 printer, J750 printer has seven print heads and the J8 series has eight. This allows the printer to print six or seven materials respectively, along with the support material. Multiple print heads mean we can actually mix multiple materials together to create new ones. This mixing allows us to take the variety of materials Polyjet technology offers, like rigid, opaque, transparent, and rubber-like, to create a palette of 500,000 plus colors, endless degrees of translucency, and soft touch capability. Whether that's for packaging design, automotive lighting, or general product design. One final thing I'd like to mention before we jump into software workflows is color accuracy. Color accuracy is important for photorealism, especially if brand colors are concerned. Stratasys has had the J7 and J8 series printers Pantone validated. For those unfamiliar, Pantone is a popular way to indicate particular colors, generally to make sure that very specific colors are used. It's common for companies to have their branding material colors be Pantone, to make sure color continuity between, between different mediums, countries, and so forth. So the minimum amount of softwares within a 3D printing workflow in color is generally two. The first being the one that generates 3D geometry, whether you're using a parametric solid modeler like SolidWorks uh, or a freeform NURBS modeler like Rhinoceros. The second is the slicer software, GrabCat Print in our case here, which will allow you to assign different materials place the model on the build tray, and set a few other parameters before sending the print job, the print job to your J-series printer. Let's take a look at what that might look like. So here, we're gonna jump into GrabCat Print. We're going to go ahead and import our file. 
In this case, it's a sneaker that was exported from its native software as multiple STL files, one per body. Once we import it, we can rotate it and start assigning uh, materials. As I mentioned before, we can actually mix materials. So before we jump into assignments, uh, we notice that the model actually has some geometry issues, which would cause printing problems for most other printers. GrabCAD software has very intuitive built-in file integrity checking and can repair files automatically, just as it did in this particular case. So now we're green lit, and now we're ready to go ahead and start assigning some materials. So in this case, I'm selecting the heel, I'm going to our material assignments, I'm actually picking digital materials, and I'm actually gonna mix our Agilus uh, Shore A30 white rubber-like material with our Ver uh, Vero white uh, rigid material. So while it displays yellow, it will actually print, print white. But what we're actually able to do now with that mixing is create a, a whole variety of shore hardnesses from shore A30, 40, 50, all the way to shore A95. Now, in the different part of the sole, the bottom, I'm actually mixing uh, Agilus white rubber-like with uh, our Vero black rigid material. So in this case, as I increase uh, shore values, the, the material actually gets darker because there's more rigid black mixed in. We can also use a simple color picker simply select what kind of color we want, select it, and that color will be assigned to the particular portion of the model. We can also adjust properties such as translucency. So in case you wanted that part to be mostly see-through, you can actually adjust that opacity from zero to 100%. All right. But let's say that you're working on this project and it's actually for somebody like, let's say, uh, FedEx. And they said, hey, we want some new sneakers for our FedEx guys, uh, but we want to make sure that you use our collect correct Pantone colors. So I'm going to jump on a uh, to Google, uh, look for some FedEx Pantone colors. Uh, and actually, Google right there tells me right away uh, what those are. So the purple is actually PMS 2685C. And again, because our software is and hardware is Pantone validated, we simply have a Pantone search tool where I can search for that value. So there we go. We found two six, uh, that particular number, and we assigned it. And now we know that, that that particular color will be correct. So if we jump in, let's say we decided that we also want to do the FedEx orange along with it. That's PMS 021C. Now, if we go ahead and try to look for that value, we realize that not every single possible Pantone color is validated. While there are about 2,000, um, again, there, there will be some that you will not be able to find. So what we can do here, actually, we can go back to that same area where we were given a Pantone code, and we can get the hex color code. So we can take that hex color value, and if we want to actually make sure that it is, again, accurate, uh, we actually have a special tool called a 3D swatch generator into which we can actually enter our hex value and create uh, a special swatch file that will be very close shades of that color uh, throughout. So in this particular case, you're looking at about 60 or so of them. And I can actually just click a button called download 3D swatch, and that will create a GrabCAD print ready file that will allow you to then import it, print it out, and physically check. So again, you could actually just use the hex picker and select it there, but again, because those are not Pantone validated, you might not get the exact shade. So that's why that um, swatch generated file is a great way to double check your work. So there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up that swatch file. So you can just take a look it's, it's about three millimeters thick, the correct thickness for color. Uh, and then it's actually specifically built for uh, the J7-5850 bed. Uh, and it goes across the whole bed there. All right. Awesome. As you can see, achieving photorealism can be simpler than you thought. In this particular case, what really stands out here are the colors along with the high fidelity. In this case, 27 micron layer thickness and astounding XY resolution make the stitching look absolutely real. 
the rubber-like soles feel and look the part. So with just a multi-body part and a little bit of time within GrabCAD, you can have realistic models in no time. A full-size shoe like this one can be printed overnight. Colors and material changes could be made based on feedback, and a new iteration could be sitting on your table for the following day. This really does help bring products to market faster. So we can assign materials, colors, and translucencies all within the printer software. While assigning single colors is nice, what about the next step? How do I, we apply image data to the models so we can get that extra level of realism? This is where color mapping or texture mapping, some people refer to as UV mapping, comes into play. This is the process of projecting a 2D image onto a three-dimensional mesh. Due to time constraints, we won't really get into all the different types of meshes, but there are generally two, triangle-based meshes and quad-based meshes. Just be aware the quad-based meshes are better for UV mapping, but both will work. So thus far, we talked about taking a CAD file such as SOLIDWORKS and then going straight to material assignments in GrabCAD. But SOLIDWORKS does not support UV mapping for 3D printing. So we need a second piece of software to be the middleman between the CAD and the GrabCAD print software. There are a ton of options out there, ranging from free ones such as Blender, middle tiers such as Rhinoceros and Keyshot, to more high-end ones such as Maya and 3ds Max. In our example, I will use the SOLIDWORKS to Rhino to GrabCAD print workflow. So right now, let's just take a quick look at UV mapping. So in this case, I'm actually in Rhino uh, 6 3D software. Right now, I'm just extruding a simple block. And we're going to shading it. And then we're going to jump into material assignments. So I'm going to create a new material, a custom one. And to that material, I'm going to assign a new color image, in this case, uh, a, 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 a wood pattern, okay? And as you can see, by default, it, it does not look bad in this particular case. On simple objects like this, uh, texture mapping can be very, very simple. And there are a couple of different mapping techniques. So by default, it does surface mapping. And then here you can see we do uh, cylindrical base projection. So it actually kind of makes a cylinder. And then from that cylinder, it projects the image onto the part. So as you can see now, our wood grain is kind of uniform going around the part but there's still some breaks in the top and bottom. Then we have what's called planar projection. So that just projects the image from one side. So as you can see, that generally kind of destroys and distorts the sides by um, kind of extending the pixels of those colors. But let's go a little one step further and make this box actually look a little bit more realistic. So I have an image here of an unwrapped, essentially six-sided box image. And I now need to apply it onto our box. So how do we actually do that? Okay. Again, I can show you some just some that some of the basic techniques will not work. You can't use box mapping on this. It doesn't look correct. So what we need to do instead, we actually have to unwrap the files. I'm going to go back to shaded so it's a little easier. And I'm going to select the scenes at which I would like this model to be unwrapped into a 2D shape. So here I'm going to select in the seam so it unwraps the sides and now a cross seam to then unwrap the remaining four surfaces. So if we go into our UV mapping tools, we now have our box unwrapped, seen in that uh, black outline, okay? And our image can be seen in the background. So at this point, all we have to do to make sure that we properly map um, the box image onto the actual box is to properly position um, the 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 mesh the 2D mesh entity at this point onto uh, our image here, okay? So at this point, it's just really tedious work, just making sure that you're, you know, lining up with the edges uh, and then making sure that you uh, scale your model appropriately to the image. So as you can see here, it's a little bit on the short side, so I'm simply going to use single uh, 1D scaling so I make sure I don't distort the model. There we go, I'm doing the same thing in the vertical. As you can see in the live preview on the right, it keeps updating as you make those changes. So you can make sure that there's no little white pixels coming in from the edges or anything like that, okay? So once we're done, we can go ahead into rendering mode and we can see here that our box is now completed. And from any 3D modeling software, as long as you can export an OBJ or a VRML or WRL file, um, those are the mesh files that support uh, full color and UV mapping. 
then you will be able to easily bring it into grab get print here i'm going to scale it up just so you can take a better look at it and that box is now ready to print we can just hit print and um, in a matter of hours we'll have it in our hands The other thing I wanted to show you is because the OBJ files have the image as a separate file constantly in the background, you actually don't have to edit the 3D file itself if you would like to make changes to the two-dimensional image. So in this case, I wanted to add a little fragile logo to one of the sides. So it actually just went to an image editor, opened up that file, added the logo, and simply reopened the 3D file. So if I reposition the part, reorient it, we'll see that now that uh, warning logo is on one of the sides, okay? All right, so now we kind of get a general idea of how it works. Let's actually take a full workflow, look, look, at, look at a full workflow from A to Z. So I'm gonna quickly design a part in SOLIDWORKS. Uh, in this case, it's just kind of a concept of a automotive kind of center console screen type of thing and uh, we're going to go ahead and bring it into rhino and we're going to texture it up and prepare a full file to print so you can see what a full a to z workflow looks like so again here i'm in solidworks got it sped up just a little bit um so we don't need because i'm sure you're familiar with cad modeling um here again i'm just dimensioning my piece getting some rough dimensions getting a rough shape going Doing some fillets. We'll add some uh, buttons to that face there. Maybe like a start stop engine button. Again, dimensioning, all that fun stuff. Better ways to go to do that more efficiently. So again, one important thing is to make sure to extrude those buttons as separate entities. So make sure not to merge them to your main body. Uh, and then lastly, for effect, I'm also going to add a little area for essentially an LCD screen. So what I'm doing right there is just creating the uh, the cavity where the, the screen would be sitting in. So some fillets in the corners. And then I'm actually going to create two bodies on there. I'm going to extrude one body, and that will represent the actual LCD screen with the image. And then I'm extruding a second body over top of that that will represent the actual clear glass uh, to give it some extra depth and extra realism. So now I can import native cat files right into Rhino 3D. They come right in as separate entities, separate bodies. So all I'm doing here is selecting my main body and hiding all my remaining elements. So I wanna work with kind of one part at a time. Uh, and I'm gonna use that similar wood effect that I had on the box previously. But with a box or a simple shape, that's very simple to do. But once you get into more complex shapes like this, you can see that these seams uh, become a real issue uh, you can see that right now, the way the regular uh, mapping works is it kind of just took all those surfaces, uh, broke them up, and then kind of threw them all over the wooden pattern. So that's why they look so disjointed uh, in the final file. And again, if I click on any of those 2D meshes, that will actually show us where those areas are represented uh, on the complete model. So again, we can take a look at those kind of standard common uh, projections that you would find, let's say, if you try to apply textures and uh, colors in SOLIDWORKS. So as you can see, cylindrical projection in this case fixed the seam issue on the edges, but now created a new issue kind of right in the center of the part where the wood kind of gets smushed together, right? So that kind of projection won't work. We can again try box, uh, sorry, try planar projection. Um, and again, that fixes the front area. Now we don't have any issues in the center. We don't have any issues on the edges, but we have issues on the complete side, right? Those pixels kind of got stretched out. So again, none of those really look right. And lastly, again, as a standard, we're gonna try to do some box mapping and see what box mapping does. So because of the sharp corners of the box, the projection also has these kind of sharp seams that do not look very realistic. So in order to fix that, we're gonna do exactly the same thing we did with the box, except here it gets a little bit more complicated. This does take some practice. Uh, you, you have to kind of understand how, what it's trying to do, where imagine that being essentially made out of paper and you're trying to break it apart and unwrap it back into just a flat two-dimensional uh, piece of paper. So 
I'm separating out the bottom area and then I'm kind of unwrapping the whole vertical area as one. And I'm also separating out the screen area because that's really not important to us because they'll be hidden by the, those other elements. So after we do that, we can go ahead and see how our entities are now mapped out. So we can see now we have three entities. We have the area where the screen is. We have uh, the bottom area that we separated out. But if we look now at our actual mapping, we, we don't have any more seam issues. Uh, it looks like our screen, again, is slightly crooked. So we can see that the wood is actually crooked as well. So we can go ahead and just use some basic transformation tools um, to go ahead and move that more vertically. We can do the same with the, the actual complete kind of rest of the model as well. Just kind of straighten it out a little bit more. I'm not going to be too particular because it looks fine either way. And then lastly, just make sure that all your entities are inside your image. All right. So now if we go back to render view, we can look up close all the way around. We don't have any issues, any kind of things that stand out um, that really make an eye jump to it. So we're good with this part. So now I'm gonna go ahead and show the remaining elements that I have. And we're gonna select uh, one of the buttons and we're gonna inverse select and hide everything else so we can work on just the button by itself. So just like before, we're gonna create a new custom material and to that custom material, we're going to add uh, an image, a color image. So in this case, I have an image of a start button that I just, again, pulled up from Google. So as you can see, the basic projection doesn't do the correct job. You can see why, right? The basic projection divided essentially all the faces um, into different entities and broke up um, the fillet area into halves. So just really not that easy and good for, for trying to map this out. What I really want is I'd like the carbon fiber pattern to be around the button and then the actual button image to be on the top face and the fillet area. So what I'm doing is I'm custom uh, seaming here, creating seams around just the fillet area so the front face and the fillet are one complete entity. Then I'm separating out the back and doing a cross seam so it would unwrap the sides. So now we have, see that's the unwrapped side I was talking about. We can go ahead and move that up on the image. So that gets a full carbon fiber effect all the way around. We're really not concerned with the back of it. So again, the back, we can kind of just move out of the way. It can also get a carbon fiber effect because it doesn't matter, it'll be hidden. And then lastly, we got to just now go ahead and actually uh, move the final front face fillet area onto the start button. So as we move it there, we can see that it's not straight. So then again, it's just basic transformation uh, to kind of straighten it out um, and then just scaling it to make sure that it fits perfectly. Okay. So there we go. Again, just kind of making final adjustments, looking at the preview, making sure no, no kind of imperfections stick out from the edges or where I'm trying to map. I'm gonna hide the other button because we already did a button and kind of get the concept. So lastly, uh, we're going to do essentially a simulated uh, LCD screen. So we're just taking a, a block. We're going to create a new custom material for that. And in this case, we're going to actually apply, a, I just again pulled up from Google, an image of, I believe, of a Tesla center console screen. So again, the issue is as before our custom mapping. So in this case, all I really care about is that front face, right? The sides and the back will be hidden. So all I'm doing is I'm creating just seams around that face to separate it out. And once we separate it out, we can go ahead into our UV mapping utility. And now we see how we divided the model. So right there is that front face that we separated out and the remaining entity is everything else. So the back and the sides. Uh, again, we're not really concerned with those, so we can just kind of get it out of the way, hide it, put it in a black area of the image so it's all black, uh, and then just spend a minute just making sure that, again, just like with the button, uh, everything is in the right place and, and the mapping is as it should. Okay, so right there, I realized it was upside down, uh, flipped it over, uh, and just made sure it's mapped to the edges. Okay. 
there we go. So now we're going to leave the, the, the glass part of it that's covering it uh, just as it is here, and we're going to export it right out of Rhino. So again, as long as we can save an OBJ file or a VRML or WRL file, uh, we should be able to successfully um, trans transfer it to GrabCAD print. So there we go. We open it up, and there it is. We have our wood effect on there. We can see that. We can clearly see that our button is indeed uh, red and has the start text on it. And then we can actually do other assignments. So if we have elements that we didn't assign any color or translucency or anything like that, we can actually just go ahead and then select those using uh, the GrabCAD selection tools, just as we used before. So again, this is kind of going to give it some depth, going to give it some reality, make it look like it's actually behind the screen. Okay. There we go. Simple as that. Last but not least, displacement mapping, sometimes also incorrectly referred to as bump mapping. It is a process of using a grayscale two-dimensional image to alter the surface of a mesh in order to gain physical texture. Bump mapping creates a similar effect, but it's purely visual in a rendering engine. The physical mesh is not altered at all. So as you can see in the example on the right, the original model was a perfectly flat box, but when a grayscale displacement map is attached to it, it moves the mesh so that the white pixels are high points and black pixels are low points, or vice versa, depending on your software settings. So using our previous example of our uh, dashboard, let's displacement map it to add some physical texture to our part. Do note that depending on your application, it may, it may also accept color images, which it will simply translate to grayscale. So let's take a look and add that to our part for a little bit for final realism. Okay, so again, I am in Rhino. So SolidWorks does also have displacement mapping capabilities at this point as of uh, 2019, but uh, it is still very limited as far as UV mapping. You do not have control of proper control of, of, of the images. So right here, I'm just changing some settings. Um, I'm actually just changing so that the black points are negative one millimeter and the white points are positive one millimeter. And I'm, I changed the initial quality of the mesh to high. Okay, and as you can see, the wood grain from the image actually transferred over and now is an actual physical um, characteristic of the part. So if we render it up, we now have full color, we have physical texture, we have images for screens and buttons. So again, just like before, we can go ahead and export it out. Bring it into Rhino, I mean, sorry, into GrabCAD. And because, um, because it does have the color right on there, it is difficult to see. Just as before, it did have some mesh errors. You know, those kind of displacement maps can totally create some uh, intersecting triangles or some other issues that might be printing problems. Uh, but again, because of GrabCAD print software, those can be repaired right away. Okay. But again, as you can see, a better visual feedback really is the original software you, where you displacement mapped it because um, without color, it just looks significantly better. So, as you can see, uh, color assignments in GrabCAD, along with UV color mapping and displacement mapping, bring together a wealth of tools that allow your imagination to go wild. So, for example, this automotive dash element you see here at the top. The wood application was done as, in a similar fashion, but just in a different software using a different wood pattern. The leather looking element is actually a displacement mapped of full color flexible material with the stitching as a separate element. The buttons and large dial were modeled and textured in the same fashion. My best advice is first do some research on what software package will do most of the techniques that you require. Then start simple and compound different realism techniques until you achieve something like this. 